Let's pray before we open God's word together. Father, thank you for the way that you bless our lives and among your greatest blessings is the gift of your word. And we pray that you would open the eyes of our heart that we might see what you want us to see and learn what you want us to learn. Not because my words are significant, but because your word is powerful and eternal. We pray this in Jesus' name, the living word made flesh. Amen. As I said, we've been exploring God over the past four weeks. This is week five in this series. And if you're new, if you haven't been paying attention, uh, hopefully you've seen as you drive around signs on the roadside, uh, on train stations and people's yards and on social media about Explore God. We're joining with over 800 churches in the Chicagoland area asking seven big questions. They're not the only questions, but they're kind of the big ones about God and faith and life. And I think the question this morning is, is um, arguably the, for the Christian, this is the question. This is the question. It kind of all comes to this and flows out of this question. The question of who is Jesus or is Jesus really God? We have just three weeks left and we come to what I would call the central question out of which the rest of them flow. Uh, In fact, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16, Jesus puts the question to his own disciples. When he asks them, they're debating about who's going to be the greatest. And Jesus takes them to a region called Caesarea Philippi, where there's pagan temples and lots of other gods of the culture, including Caesar worship around him, them. And in verse 13, now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus asked the question, who do you say I am? He puts it to his disciples, and I think he puts it to us this morning. Is Jesus really God? Who is Jesus? And everything, as I said, hinges on how you answer this question. Christianity is essentially coming to grips with the identity of Jesus. There isn't Christianity unless you understand who Jesus claimed to be and answered it in the way that he says we should. Historically, some have sought to dismiss or evade this question by denying that Jesus of the Gospels really existed. That he's more myth or legend, doctored and reinvented over history by those who were, were his followers. Sort of a power play down through the centuries for them to continue to promulgate this idea. Now, we'll deal next week with the question of, can you trust the Bible? How can I know the Bible, particularly the New Testament accounts, are reliable? But the New Testament did not begin as a single book written to promote an over, a one view of Jesus. Now, sometimes people will say, look, it's um, because there are lots of different accounts and they were swirling around, that's used to discredit the Christian claims. But if you pause for a minute and realize something, the New Testament... The books of the New Testament, were not, it was not one document written by a, one or a small group of people to promote one particular view. They were individual letters and accounts written by numbers of individuals circulating around at different parts of the Roman world, the Mediterranean world, at different times in, in that first century to first century and a half AD. And they're all telling one story. They were compiled by those who wanted to say these are the earliest accounts that we have and the most reliable, most trusted by the eyewitnesses, and they were compiled together later, which is actually evidence. So when when people say today, well, I want some evidence outside of the Bible for the existence of Jesus, you're actually, though it's, it's common to say, well, because the Bible can't be trusted, so I want other sources. But actually, even secular New Testament scholars will tell you, you're asking, by definition, for sources that are, that are not primary but secondary. To ask for sources outside the New Testament is to ask for historical sources that aren't closest to those events, weren't written by those closest to them, are less, therefore, reliable. William Lane Craig uh, writes, to ask for historical evidence for Jesus outside the New Testament documents is to ask for later secondary derivative sources that are themselves usually reliant on the New Testament accounts. Now, there, there are 
out, external sources. We'll talk about these next week. Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Josephus, the Babylonian Talmud. There are lots of external sources to the Bible that verify many of the things about claims about Jesus. But the most reliable sources are what we're looking at. So let's look at the claims of Jesus. Let's examine first, who did Jesus think he was by asking the question, who did he claim to be? Now, anyone who reads the Gospel of John and still wants to argue that Jesus never claimed to be God has a serious uphill battle in front of them. John's Gospel is the Gospel of Jesus' divinity. They all point to it in different ways, but above, of the four, John is the one that highlights it over and over again. And he begins his Gospel with the words we talked about a couple of weeks ago. In the beginning was the Word, the capital W, Logos, divine first principle, and the Word was with God, and the was, Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side has made him known. Do you ever stop and ponder that verse? No one's ever seen God. The only God who is at his side. God who's at God's side. What? Has made him known. Or consider the I am statements of the Gospel of John. Some of you will know from your Old Testament study or maybe your Sunday school days or just from watching the movie uh, The Ten Commandments or that uh, God speaks to Moses out of a burning bush. And his primary message is go back to Egypt, I'm going to deliver my people, and Moses doesn't want to go. He's kind of a whiner. And he complains and he gives excuses. And one of his excuses is, what if people ask me who sends me? What should I say? And God says to him, I am who I am. Tell them, I am is sending you. That phrase, I am, is the Hebrew word Yahweh, which no faithful Jew would pronounce for fear of pronouncing it improperly and committing blasphemy unintentionally. Anytime you see the word Lord, L-O-R-D, in all caps in the Old Testament, that's the reference to Yahweh, I am. And then you read in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, John 6, 35. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. I am the good shepherd in John 10, 11. I am the resurrection and the life in John eleven twenty five. 25. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We talked about that last week in John 14, 6. And I am the true vine, and on and on. But perhaps the biggie, the claim that got him in the most trouble of the I am statements, comes in John chapter 8, verses 54 to 58. I really need to bring my glasses with me. <laughs> Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not even 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. I wonder about that last sentence. How did he hide himself and go out of the temple? Was it magic? How did he do that? Did he duck? Do you hear what's happening there? Were the, were the Jews just cranky? Why did they pick up stones to stone him? He's committing in their mind blasphemy. He's not just saying, I'm really old. That'd just, he'd be crazy then. You'd commit him to an asylum maybe, but you don't stone him. He's saying, before Abraham is born, I am. It's unavoidable if you read the Gospel of John. And again, some people, because it's so unavoidable, it's so in your face who Jesus is claiming to be, that you almost have to find some other way of saying, well, you can't trust those accounts. If you don't want to accept Jesus as God, you've got to find some way of explaining this away because John's gospel is in your face with who Jesus is. Now, it might surprise you then that I want to take you for a period of time to a different gospel, since John's is the one that talks so much about this, the gospel of Luke. I'm going to read Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. This is um, 
It's a passage, it's brilliant, and it's amazing, there's so much in it, but it's not often used to talk about Jesus' divinity. But I think it has so much to say to us about who Jesus understood himself to be. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, and was, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? We'll stop there. It's an amazing passage. Let me set the scene for you. Jesus is in Nazareth. That's the town he grew up in. It's his hometown where everybody knew him as a boy. Nazareth, by most accounts, was somewhere between 150 and 200 people. A very small village to the southwest of the Sea of Galilee in the northern region of Israel. It's a nothing town, village. In fact, it was looked down on by most people. Nothing good comes from Nazareth. But everybody knew everybody in Nazareth. You ever, anybody here grew up in a small town? Everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody and everybody's business, right? This is what it was like for Jesus. He goes back to his hometown, and it's the Sabbath day, so he goes to the local synagogue where he grew up. That would be like me going back to Crystal Lake, Illinois, where I grew up, to the Crystal Lake Evangelical Free Church, which is now a different building, but never mind. I go back there. And I, people all knew me. I got kicked out of Sunday school. Pastor Jeff was told by Mrs. Kingston that he, she couldn't come back for a week because I was misbehaving in Sunday school when I was in fourth grade. Go back to there, there right? Gee, everybody knows him. And <laughs> he stands up to read, takes the Isaiah scroll, we're not told exactly, but I imagine it this way. Just, there's no chapter numbers and verse numbers. It's just text on a massive scroll. Just unrolls it to the spot he wants. Starts reading this one little passage. Hands the scroll back to the scroll guy, the attendant, and sits down. That's the posture of a teacher. Every eye fixed on him. You could have heard a pin drop. What's he going to say? Silent. And Jesus' whole sermon, his whole exposition of this text from Isaiah chapter 61, he reads one, verses 1 and 2. His whole, the Son of God in the flesh, expounding and expositing the word of the prophet Isaiah from God, his whole sermon is one sentence. Maybe you're wishing that Pastor Jeff could get that good. I'm not Jesus, takes me a lot more sentences. And he says, today, the scripture has been fulfilled. And he sits down. Like the ultimate mic drop moment, right? This is it. Today it's fulfilled. It sits down. And all the people are amazed. And then they also say, wait a second. First they're astounded. Then they go, isn't that Joseph's boy? Didn't he get kicked out of Sunday school? Don't we know him? It's an incredible scene. His whole sermon is to say, that's me. Because he's quoting Isaiah. And Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, you read that and you might think Isaiah's talking about himself. But when you read it in the context of the actual Isaiah scroll, the text of Isaiah, he's not talking about himself. He's talking about it's God speaking through the prophet. And the context of Isaiah 61 is not Isaiah, it's the Lord speaking. So Isaiah's not talking about himself, he's talking about God. Who's the me? In Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Who's the me? Jesus says, I am. I'm the me. You're looking at him. This is a, a shocking thing. It's easy for us to miss. But nobody misses it in that day. It's just, that's why they say, wait a second, isn't this Joseph's son? 
and he's saying he's the one that Isaiah was talking about? It's an astounding claim. Now, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is the quote from Isaiah. Now, we get to the Old Testament. Anytime the spirit of the Lord shows up, it's good for God's people. It's, good. it's a good thing. The spirit comes at Pentecost uh, and fills the hearts of all believers now. The spirit of the Lord is present with us now. But in the story of the Old Testament, God's spirit was always present, but would show up in power at particular times to do God's work. And it was for his glory and our ultimate good to Redeem, release from bondage, restore people. And then he says, to preach good news. In Greek, that's the word euangelion. It's our, where we get our word gospel from. It means glad tidings or good announcement. So Jesus says, the spirit you know about who shows up to bless God's people and bring him glory is on me to give you the good announcement. To set liberty for the captives. Now, often that phrase, liberty for the captives, or set free those who are oppressed, or good news for the poor, we hear that and we think, Issues of justice, the oppressed, the marginalized, the poor. And that is certainly an outgrowth, an outworking of the gospel, and the church should care about that, and we should be working for those things. But the word liberty, the word set free or liberty, is a different word. It's the word aphesis in Greek. It doesn't, it's always used when Luke writes in Luke and in Acts, that Greek word aphesis is always used to talk about forgiveness. The, the, the liberty Jesus is primarily talking about is forgiveness of sins. Not just working to set free those who are in bondage in prison or in, in bondage to debt or poor and in, in, in captive that way. That is something Jesus does and we should do. But his primary point is the good news is not just we're going to change the social structures around so there's no more poor. The good news is the liberty you get is freedom from your sin. Forgiveness from the law of sin and death. Think about what Jesus is saying here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the good news that sets captives free. Forgiveness from sin. This is, he's not just saying, this is, this one sentence sermon is amazing. Today, what, you, what the prophet Isaiah looked for, what you long for, is fulfilled. Because I'm here. And then he says, sight for the blind which is, if you, anytime you read through the work of Jesus, he's obviously, there are times when he's actually making blind people, physically blind people see, but this is pointing to spiritual sight, to have our eyes open to see him as he truly is. This part of Isaiah are all the signs of the presence of God. Captive set free, poor and oppressed raised up, blind people seeing, lame people walking, Good news announced. God is here. God is on the move. Jesus is saying, this is me. And then he says, the year of the Lord's favor. Now, we don't have time to get into this too much, but this is an Old Testament reference, Leviticus 25, the year of Jubilee. Uh, every 50th year, property returned to its original owners, slaves set free, debts canceled. Like the, it's, a, it's a year of restoration, of resetting. And it's meant to make God's people, us included, Think and look forward to the ultimate time when God would come and restore and reset everything. Jesus says, that's me. I'm that one that's going to restore and reset all things. In fact, all the miracles and the works of Jesus are, are really to be understood in this light. I, I talk to people from time to time who have issues with the miracles of Jesus, you know. They want to remove the, remove the miraculous and we'll get to this in a minute, but the central claim of our faith is a miracle, the resurrection. I remember one time talking to a guy one time who said he, he really had an issue with the story of Jonah. He just said, I can't believe in a book that says a guy lived in a fish for three days. And I said, well, I understand why that might be strange. But if God can raise a man from the dead, that he can store a guy in a fish, I mean, really... They're all, all of the miracles of Jesus are pointing us somewhere. They're saying something, or meant to, about his authority. John 10, verses 31 to 33. Jesus picked, the, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him, and Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, 
it's not for a good work we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself equal to God. Make yourself God. So this is an important point. Even the enemies of Jesus understood what he was saying. In Jesus' day, nobody's walking around going, he's a good moral teacher. Even those who opposed him, they got it. They didn't like it. They saw it as a threat. They didn't believe it. But they understood what his claims and his works were pointing to. It's only in our contemporary day that we go, well, you know, let's not get crazy. He's just a good guy. Let's talk about the works of Jesus briefly. The works of Jesus. If you were to go through all the gospel accounts of Jesus' miracles, you'd see that they each point in some way to a different aspect of his divine authority. You see, for example, uh, his authority over nature when he has, he calms the storm. You see his authority over sickness and disease when he makes a lame man walk or uh, heals people from blindness or uh, paralysis or, and you see his authority over uh, spiritual powers, demonic powers, when he heals people of possession and of mental health issues. You see his authority over creation, over sickness and, and, and disease, over powers and authorities, and over sin and death itself when he raises Lazarus from the dead. And of course, his own resurrection, which we'll come to in a moment. But one of the accounts that make this most explicit is in Luke chapter 5. I don't have time to get into this too much, but some of you will know this story. It's the healing of a paralytic. Do you remember this story? Four friends bring their buddy who's paralyzed to see Jesus. Because the word spreads about this guy that he's a great healer. And they want their friend to be healed. And they can't get in because it's a small house and it's crowded. And Jesus is teaching inside. There's no room inside. There's hardly any room outside. And so they're, they're determined and they have some ingenuity. So they climb up on the roof and they start tearing apart the roof. And I imagine that this way, I like to imagine, you know, they had to guess where Jesus was. Like you're on the roof. Where is he? I think they're probably ripping up little holes going to the left. They move over here, you know, they go, oh, back. Okay, here's the spot. Yes, yes, right here. They make a big spot wide enough, you know. So there's stuff falling down, right? Can you imagine if that starts happening now? I'd be a little annoyed. Yeah, you're interrupting my sermon, right? There's a hole in the roof, and they're lowering this guy down on ropes. I also imagine, like, they're, you know, they got to keep him level. <laughs> Come on, Pete, stay with us, you know. Get him flat down there. And he's laying there, and he's paralyzed. Can't move. I imagine he's like, it's my friend's idea. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Jesus, it's, I told him this was a bad idea, right? And Jesus looks at this guy. He's not annoyed. He's not perturbed. He's so in the moment. He looks at this guy and he says, I tell you, your sins are forgiven. Now, that is so important. Now, for one thing, that's not what they brought him there for. I imagine them going, what did he say? He's not going to make him walk? Your sins are forgiven. In the crowd, Jesus knows what, what he's so aware of what's going on. In the crowd are religious authorities and leaders and Pharisees. And they begin to in their own, grumble to each other and in their own minds. Who does this guy think he is? Only God can forgive sins. Right? Jesus answers them, though they're not voicing it out loud. He says that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, to act as God. In other words, he's saying that you may know that I'm the one you think can forgive sins, that I'm God. I say, get up and walk. And the guy does. Can you imagine those four friends? Yes, high fives all around. You know, he walks out praising God. The whole story, so much going on, the whole story is about the authority of Jesus to forgive sins, which only God can do. That's why the miracles are given to us. Not to wow us, not to make us think he's cool, not to get us distracted, but in each case to point us to his divine authority over creation, over nature, over disease, over sickness, over sin and death itself. This, Jesus makes the same point essentially in John 10, 37 to 38, just a little further down from the passage we read a moment ago. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. What you see me doing, does it point you to God? If it doesn't, don't believe me. But if it does, and you have a hang up with me, at least believe in what's happening. It says, this is the reason for my works. My point here, to try to make it shorter, 
is that the claims of Jesus and the miracles of Jesus go hand in glove. They're for the same purpose. He's making claims about himself that you can't deny if you understand what he's saying. And he's doing things to back up those claims. When you start to get a sense of this, you got to deal with this. Who is this guy? Where do we put him? How do you make sense of him? The works of Jesus are meant to point you to the divinity of Jesus. The miracles are not an end in themselves. They are pointing us to him who is the end. Both in the first century and in the 21st century, I think we we get this wrong. We think of God as a means to our end, as what Jesus can do for us. You wouldn't say that, maybe you're too spiritually sophisticated to say that out loud, but we think and operate this way. But if Jesus is God, if Jesus is God, then he's not a means to your end. He's not a faith you employ to get what you want in life. He's not a divine life coach. He's not a miracle worker on your behalf. This is a question you really can't evade. In fact, have you ever stopped to consider that almost all the world religions have a place for Jesus? But that's not true of Muhammad or Buddha or others. Islam has a place for Jesus. Isa, Jesus, is a, one of the great prophets, just below Muhammad. Buddhism thinks he's one of the enlightened ones on the path of the Buddha. Mormons claim that he was created by Father God, our first, the firstborn of all of us. Job's witnesses say he's the, actually the archangel Michael. And of course, there's a thousand and one and more different ways of saying that he's a great moral teacher. My point is, you just can't avoid this guy. Everybody's trying to categorize him somewhere. Everybody's trying to put him somewhere. What do we do with him? You can't just pretend he didn't exist or didn't say, make the claims that he did. What do you do with him? I still come back to the fact that those that were his followers, it never, and those that lived and opposed him, Nobody had the category in the first century, second, third, fourth, fifth century AD of a great moral teacher. Jesus was and should still be a great dividing line. Some of you will be familiar with what sometimes has been called the trilemma that C.S. Lewis made popular, but did not invent actually, G.K. Chesterton and actually some of the church fathers before him. But Lewis popularized it. The Lord, liar, lunatic argument. Some of you might be aware of this in his book, Mere Christianity. He writes this, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who says that he's a poached egg, or else he'd be the devil of hell himself. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord. But let us not come to him with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. It's just not intellectually honest or aware to put him in the category of a great moral teacher. Now, I've heard criticisms of this argument. It's a very strong argument. Josh McDowell used it in his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. It's been repeated many, many times. It's a strong argument, Lord, liar, lunatic. If Jesus, if you take what he said seriously, the claims he made about himself, then he's either lying, I mean, he knows he's not God and he's telling you different. That's not a guy worth trusting. There are liars in pulpits today. Or he actually thinks he's God, but he's not God, which means he's nuts. You shouldn't follow a crazy man. Or he's who he said he was. Now, I've heard criticism of this argument this way. Well, you're leaving out a couple of other possibilities. Perhaps he never said those things at all. Well, we'll deal with that next week in the reliability of the New Testament. Or perhaps... His disciples believed him to be that, 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 but he didn't. Perhaps his disciples thought he was this, had the wrong idea about him. 
Lewis also addresses this. He says, this is extremely difficult, beyond impossible, because his followers were all Jews. That is, they belonged to the one nation in the world at the time, which of all others was most convinced that there was only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6. There could not possibly be any other God or gods. It's very odd that this horrible invention about a religious leader should grow up among the one people in the whole earth least likely to make such a claim or a mistake. On the contrary, we get the impression that none of his immediate followers or even of the New Testament writers embraced the doctrine all that easily. It took convincing. It took rising from the dead for them to get it. So the least likely people on the planet to invent the idea that a man who walked the earth is God himself would be first century Jews. It's not going to happen. Their whole worldview is predicated on Yahweh. You can't even say his name is one. And he's so far beyond us. What would possibly convince this group of first century Jewish followers that he was indeed God in the flesh? This brings us, I think that clock has to be wrong, to the resurrection of Jesus. You know, it, it, it's very tempting today. and we, we, we can't even scratch the surface on the resurrection. I, I would commend to you a book which most of you will know about called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. When I worked at Willow Creek Community Church over 20 years ago, Lee Strobel was on staff there. Lee came to faith in Christ as an atheist working for the Chicago Tribune, an investigative reporter. His wife became a Christian, and he was annoyed by that. So he set out to prove the, Jesus wrong. And his research, bringing all of his investigative journalistic skills to bear over a two-year period, led him to the reluctant admission at first that Jesus is who he said he was. Here's what Strobel writes at the second to last chapter of his book, The Case for Christ. He says, I ad I'll admit it. I was ambushed by the amount and quality of the evidence that Jesus is the unique son of God. I shook my head in amazement. I had seen defendants carted off to the death chamber on far less convincing proof. The cumulative facts and data pointed unmistakably toward a conclusion that I wasn't entirely comfortable reaching. Now, Strobel is a devoted Christ follower, and he became very comfortable. That's how he started. Lewis himself called himself the most reluctant convert in all of England when he converted to faith in Jesus. Uh, I have to quickly decide what not to include here. <laughs> the, my point is that the, the, the claims of Jesus, the works of Jesus, culminate in the resurrection of Jesus. Without the resurrection of Jesus, claims and works, you could argue them away. There have been conjurers, miracle workers in other parts of history and other parts of the world. There have been those who claimed to be God and were wrong. But when you put those things together, the historical reliability of the New Testament, which we'll talk about next week, the bold and unmistakable claims of who Jesus understood himself to be, the incredible things that he did and does today through his followers, and the fact that he conquered de death and the grave, you must make a choice. You can shut him up for a fool can spit on him and call him a liar and a demon, or you can fall on your knees and worship him as Lord. Apostle Paul makes this abundantly clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 through 17. Before this, he says, I, I pass on to you that it was of first importance. What's most important is that Jesus Christ died, according to the scriptures, that he was raised the third day, according to the scriptures. And then he says in verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise. If it's true, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. I would say it this way. Christianity stands or falls on Jesus being who he claimed to be, God. And Jesus' divinity, Jesus' claim to be God, stands or falls on the resurrection. Our faith all hangs together on the singular historical fact that Jesus claimed to be God and that he rose from the grave and ascended to heaven. If that is not true, <laughs> what are you doing here? There are better things to do with your Sunday morning. There are better things to do with your Sunday morning. You shouldn't listen. You really shouldn't care. 
But if it is true. And this is a conviction God has been laying on my heart. You know, I, maybe you don't pay attention to the news like I do or follow what's happening in the church world in the Chicagoland area, but it's not good these days. It's not good. I don't, I don't know details and I don't want to know some details, but what I do know makes me sad. It makes me tremble a bit. And I, there are lots of people, some of you maybe even, who feel as if, like, just you can't trust people in authority, spiritual authority. And I hear from people all the time who want to dismiss who Jesus is based on the stupid things his followers do. They've been hurt by churches. I saw on the, on, um, come across the internet an ad for a church conference about those who've been wounded by churches. A conference for people who've been beat up by churches. What's happening that we need a conference like that? Now, I haven't lost hope. Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I believe that with all my heart. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't. But I also acknowledge that there are a lot of people who won't listen to the claims of Jesus because of just the, the corruption, the deceit, the narrow-mindedness, the arrogance of many of people who claim to be his children and his followers. And, and for those of you who are, like me, his followers, or those of you who are exploring, I just want to say this as lovingly as I can. You can't really slide out from underneath the claims of Jesus because you're irritated with what his followers have done. I'm not talking about this church or any church or denomination or religious structures. I'm talking about the person, Jesus of Nazareth. Who is he? Everything holds together on that, the answer to that question. How you answer that question is your whole life, friends. It's everything. It isn't coming to church and evaluating the music or do I like the the, the nuances of this program or we get messed up with all the ancillary stuff. The central issue is who is Jesus? Who is he to you? And some of you, it's possible to be around the church for a long time and answer that one wrong. Or intellectually say, oh, I believe he's God. But then that doesn't translate into how you live your life under his authority, in obedience to his word, carrying out his will, acting as he acted in the world, wanting to become like him in your character, in your speech, and in your thoughts. This question is not just for those who are still exploring. For those of us, for me too, who say we belong to him, then we have to, is he my God? What is the response to he's God? Awesome. I'll put that over here and consider that later. When I fall on my knees and say, you're my king. You call the shots. You're in charge. We're uh, significantly over time. But he's Jesus. <laughs> Let me pray. Father God, I don't know every heart in here, but you do. You made each person in this room and in all of our campuses and all over this world in your image, and you desire a relationship with them, and you've made that relationship possible through your Son, Jesus Christ. And I believe by your Spirit you speak to us, not just those who are far from you or exploring or investigating, but even those of us who say we believe and are here every week. We too need to come face to face again with the question of the reality and the the identity of your son. We too need to lay our lives down in humble surrender and adoration and obedience to the one who claims to be the king of the universe and of our hearts. And that is not, that is the best news possible, Lord. Because if if, if you're not who you say you are, Lord Jesus, then we're still lost, we're still searching, we're still floundering around. But God, I, we believe, and we want to believe. So help us in our unbelief to trust you, Lord Jesus, our King and our God. Amen.